to the Mike Clegg podcast and today we've got Ben Thornley with us. Ben, thank you very much for coming. Morning, mate. Ben Thornley obviously got a great history in football. He's basically been in football all his life. Um, so Ben, you know, just tell me a little bit about your, your youth and um, obviously your initial getting involved in football. Where was you born? And you know, this incredible story of going to Man United and now you're ultimately working in, in, in punditry and doing lots and lots of football work related. Your life has always been about football, but where did that actual seed start from? Um, it's, a, it's a good question, actually. I think when I, um, when I was about seven years old, um, I went along in, in to... Um, a trial for my school uh, and it was primary school so mm. it, it wasn't like at secondary school where you had you know each age group had had a, a, a separate side this was like a junior team so it was anything from seven to eleven year olds uh, and I was the only seven year old that managed to get on the team and didn't just managed to get on the team I, he, I, he actually played me the, the Tony Potter he was called my teacher Good memory, and he, yeah. pl he played me in um, in, in, in my very first game and I scored in it uh, in a 4-3 win I remember doing it and I think it was just from then on in that, I mean even up until that point my dad had always sort of you know taken me out and, and you know kicked a ball with me without yeah. I, I, you see these what teams now you're getting like you know under sixes and under sevens and stuff like that and um, I, I was just happy just you know knocking a ball against the wall playing with my dad and what have you and then the first opportunity that I got to play football was uh, was when I was seven, just just seven years old in uh, in my prim in my primary school or junior school as it was then, and then it just progressed from there. That was just you know playing for school. Um, I was picked to play for Salford Boys, which was where I first came across Ryan. Right. Um, uh, um, he was under eleven, but I I got in with a, another another pal of mine uh, at under. Well, we were still under tens, but we we played a year. Um, and then obviously you get into into secondary school and you get picked for your, your town team, so for boys, then the county, you get scouts coming to watch you, etc. And it all, you know, snowballs. Um, and then Manchester United came calling while I was, um, I was actually um, training in the evening with Man City. Really? Oh, mm. That's interesting. And I As Ryan was. But I remember my youth and... You, you do then. I, I, we talk a little bit about in the, the other podcasts I've done about the pressures the kids now are under at such a young age, being a part of the academy at six or seven, turning up and you got your badges on and a certain amount of pressure. We didn't really have that back in the day. Really. No, no, it was it was all about enjoyment for me. Even oh. you know, right up until you know I was sort of fourteen, fifteen. Um, there were it, it was a bit sad as well because of the amount of stuff that I was doing um, I had to play for my school and I was playing for Salford Boys I was playing for my county I'd been picked to play for England around that time as well um, and it was if I wasn't playing I was training mm. uh, and I also had a, a Sunday League team that I was playing for that I was really fond of and I'd been playing for, for two or three years in fact it was outside of my school team it was the first other team that I, I played for so I'd been with them for, for three or four years but something I had to give um, because I was still at school mm. and I wasn't you know I wasn't what I would call um, I wasn't thick but I, I wasn't I was never going to go to university but I knew that I, I, I would I would I would need to work to get some decent grades and my football just wasn't allowing me to do any of that so I needed to find time for that and 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 make sure that I was still enjoying my football and I mean I, w I was coming across lads at, at that age that were you know they were playing a game in the morning a game in the afternoon on both Saturdays and Sundays they were playing like four games in a weekend and they were training during the week and doing what and I, I just couldn't have done that I had one game at the weekend and that was playing for Salford boys on a Saturday morning well that's interesting because then lads probably thought to play all this football will make them better players well, you didn't play all that football but you was one of the best players especially at that, that youth age and I think a lot of parents and children they've got to really think about how much they're being exposed to just one sport all the yeah time. absolutely I mean uh, what are the chances I mean I, I played one game a, a, a week um, on a regular basis okay one for me school but for Salford boys and I knew that there was a good chance that in both of those games I would be able to perform mm. And, and perform well I don't think that I could have said the same thing if I was playing four games in a weekend that I would have been, I would have been brilliant for 16 games a month 
there's just no chance it wouldn't have happened and I would have got bored of it and I think that sometimes that's what happens that that you, you know people it's not the amount you play it's the quality that you churn out when you do actually play um, that will help you to improve and also stop you from getting bored of it there's a lot of good advice within that definitely so when you went for your first trial at Man United or the very first time you put on that Man United strip how was that? Because <laughs> um, you was at Man City, you were saying? I was, yeah. I was at Man City up until the point that um, that um, Sir Alex Ferguson and, and Brian Kidd actually turned up yeah. um, at my front door. One they Friday, actually front door, one did Friday they? night, yeah. They never did yeah. that for me, pal. Yeah, they came to my front <laughs> door. Um, I, I, the, the whole thing is, is in my book yeah, anyway. Yeah. And, There's a little naughty plug there for his yeah, book. Yeah, What's it called, book? Ben? Tackle. It's called Tackle. Yeah, Great tackled. book, definitely go and have a look at that. Um, it's, a, it's a good story, and uh, obviously Ben's telling us a little bit about it now. So Ferguson and Brian Kidd went to your house? Yeah, they came to, they came to my house, and they, you know, they wanted to... Uh, they wanted to speak to my parents and and try and con convince them that after you know the, they'd seen me play after they'd sent scouts to see me play because where I played for Sulphur Boys was right literally right next door to the Cliff Training Ground okay. so they regularly you know sent people mm. when when they were at home as they did when when Ryan played the year older they they sent people down um, so it was quite a, a a regular thing to have to have scouts coming to watch Sulphur Boys and. And they uh, they convinced me that that Manchester United was the place that I should be, um, and with that I I got my dad to to ring Man City and say that I would no longer be there. I hadn't signed anything, nor did I sign anything with Man United okay. uh, until the time was. I thought that that suited us both. That you know at the time when it comes to to, to taking your apprenticeship on. Um, do they still want me and do I still want them? And yeah. I think it, it worked for both parties. And the answer was yes. But if you when I was saying my story, I probably didn't meet Alex Ferguson properly until I got into the reserves, so to speak, and you know, I'd become a part. Of maybe I, I could become a, a good player. But for you, at such a young age and coming to your house, what type of feeling did that emote? And you was a top player, but you're playing for England at this stage, and obviously the scouts are after you. Yeah. To get that knock and to see, you know, them guys there, how did that feel to a young lad? Well, I, I mean, it just everything else that that might have been on the cards and and that I'd been offered uh, up until that point. I'd just completely evaporated mm. in in the space of him ringing the doorbell and my, my, my dad opening the door because I obviously knew the reason why he was there. Um, and Manchester United is the team that I'd followed, the team that you know I'd watched Brian Robson, who was my hero. Yeah. And uh, and from the manager turning up at my house to less than eighteen months later, my hero, who Brian Robson. Was uh, was walking down the stairs as I was walking up on one of my first days at the cliff, and he and he gave me a pair of boots to wear because he wanted to make sure that I got the blisters from him and not him. But I was more than happy to do it. And when I went to give them him back, he um, he said, "If they fit you and you like them, you can keep them. I've got loads." So I just went right, and they were the boots that I wore when uh, when when we won the youth cup. Really? Mm. Wow. So some great memories there from such a young age. And he was playing at England as well. Tell us a few experiences playing for England. The youth age, and obviously you played from a few different levels. Yeah, under 15s um, was the first time I, w I was chosen, and uh, and ironically, I would come up against three of them again in the youth cup final years and years later. And this is the great Leeds team. This right? is the Leeds team, yeah. um, and playing with me for England at the time was was Mark Tinkler, who was a centre midfielder, yeah. uh, Jamie Forrester, who scored a fabulous overhead kick That's in the right. final, and Kevin Sharp, who played left back against Keith Gillespie, and they all played. Um, football with me for for England at under 15 level, and yeah, and I mean it was um, it was a, a Nicky Butt as well. Um, he didn't get in from the start, but with a little bit of sort of juggling round, um, he came in. I think after the first two games, if I remember rightly, and then he he stayed for the rest of the time. Right. Um, so uh, again, it was just a, a trial basis at uh, Trent Polytechnic. Um, and the manager was Dave Bushell, who a lot of people at Manchester United uh, will know from his time spent there over the, a good few years now. So he was the he was the manager, Dave Bushell, and um, and slowly but surely the 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 number of lads from I don't know 160 odd was whittled down to a to a squad of 20, and uh, and we went playing in some in some not so great places, but one place that we did play in was the old. Um, 
Munich Stadium, yeah. by Munich Stadium, with the you know the one with the webbed roof, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we played two games back to back in Germany, one there and the other one at the Olympic Stadium in Berlin, where Jesse Owens won his four gold medals in yeah. the nineteen was it 1936 oh, yeah. Olympic Games so that that was uh, that was quite special we won one and lost one that was that was quite special so uh, and obviously got to play at Wembley as well in 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 the home games so that again some great memories there but then you join Man United as a YT and then you go through that transition you're in that youth team you know obviously that, that's a great um, 92 uh, renowned team and Eric Harrison was there to guide you guys and but he was one of the very first players to get an opportunity uh, to have a sniff around the first team but talk to us first of all about the, that youth cup and that that you, when you was a first year you won the youth cup didn't you then That's the right. second year you got you got beat but yeah we got beat in the fight yeah I mean the, the first year I think it, it it very very quickly was established that we were you know we were not bad we were a good side yeah we were a good side <laughs> Um, and they tried as best they can, especially on the on the build up to um, a, a youth cup game, which would always take place in midweek. Um, they tried to keep the the team or the nucleus of the team that was going to play in that youth cup in in the previous weekend. Uh, they didn't want to not play them unless the game fell on a Monday. But more of more often than not, it would be a, a Wednesday or a Thursday that we would play. So we'd have a game at the weekend, and we, maybe we would pl we'd all play together in the B team. Yeah. There might be one or two that that played in the A team, but that's how they 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 got us prepared for it. Obviously, we trained and then we we played a game together. Um, and yeah, we won. Uh, everybody was expecting Spurs to win it, but we gigs his help in the first year and and get meeting them in the semi-final and Nicky Barnby being sent off and mm. we took a 3-0 lead to White Hart Lane and they were that they were that cocksure that we weren't going to mess it up that Giggs he didn't even play the second leg and mm. I think I scored within about 10 or 15 minutes of the kickoff and they had a, a huge uphill battle Spurs and we ended up winning the game and the tie 5-1 and they were you know real favourites Darren Caskey, Sol Campbell, Nicky Barnby, Andy Turner I mean they had a, a really really good side and, and we all knew that if we could beat them we'd beaten probably the best side in it and comprehensively as well and we beat Palace who gave us a decent game in the final but more so in the home leg at Old Trafford we'd done the hard work by by winning 3-1 at Sellers Park in the in the first game and and it, it, we we approached the second season the same you know in the leagues we'd moved up most of us have moved up and we played regularly for Eric in the A team mm -hmm. a lot of us were were playing reserve team football as well um on a not on a on a regular basis but we you know the, when whenever it was possible because obviously we still had another crack at the to of retaining the youth cup and again we got to the final we had a real scare in the semi against Millwall mm. when they all came out with every single one of them had shaved their heads <laughs> it was and, and it's not a, even for you know a lad well a lad of 17 18 yeah. you the support that they have is uh was that down it, at the it, den? Down at the, the, the new den, yeah. yeah. They've not been in it very long, but I tell you what, they uh, they can they can intimidate. There's no question. And yeah. when we're only kids, uh, and then they they all come out with their head shaved and what have you. <laughs> and I think we only managed we got through that just in extra time. Um, and then we played a very very good, very physical Leeds team yeah. um, that had a little bit of everything. Um, and we you know we perhaps thought that we'd again like the previous season we'd done the hard part we would got past a very good side in the semi-final and we were going to win it uh, because we weren't playing a, a Liverpool or a Man City or a, or a Spurs or a Chelsea all, all teams that we know have, have had good youth teams in the past we were playing Leeds and of course back then Cleggy as you know it was all regionalised so yeah. we didn't play anybody from any other part of the country other than the North West so we knew nothing about Leeds at all but Eric warned us that you know he'd watched them against Norwich in the semi-final and they were a decent side and um, even though they'd lost the game but they'd won the first leg 4-1 lost the second leg 2-0 but they still went through 4-3 on aggregate yeah. and Eric had seen the loss in the 2-0 Obviously, it probably would have been better for us if he'd have seen so the 4-1 yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that was the team that turned up against us in, in both games at Old Trafford and at Ellen Road. And I, I've spoken with uh, Noel Whelan, who, yeah. uh, who obviously played and scored in, in the final. Um, I've spoken with Noel Whelan on, on 
three or four occasions and, and I, I have always mentioned the fact that they, they thoroughly deserve to win it. Yeah, definitely. Is. Um, so what was the difference between the first year and the second year? Obviously, Giggsy didn't play in the second year, did No, he? Giggsy didn't play in the second year. Any, and any other changes? In, in what, so tell us, the, just go through some of the names, obviously. Well, Giggsy didn't play in the second year. Uh, we lost Kevin Pilkington as well, who was our goalkeeper. Yeah. Um, uh, Simon Davis was our captain. Okay. Um, Colin McKee. So these are decent players. Well, I remember these are good players. Yeah, Colin McKee was also. I mean, Colin was even when when we played in the first year. He was an August birthday, so he was actually two, two years, years okay, yeah. above, but could, was still eligible. Um, so you know, they were all players that played, and we had to find voice for them. I mean, you, you, you're never going to find anybody to fill a gap for Giggsy. Giggsy of course. Um, but where I played. Um, continually on the left and, and Sav was the one who made way for Giggsy to play centre forward in the first year we obviously had Sav as a, yeah. as a you know permanently up there in the second year um, we, we had um, we had Scolzi who came to the fore um, so he's not a bad replacement at all for Simon Davis so Scolzi played centre midfield with um, with Nicky Butt yeah so Scolzi a bit of a late developer but within that team there you know you go through them names even the likes of you know, John O'Kane who played first team. John, tremendous player, Many yeah. other boys within that sort of squad there. And you all created and carved out good careers for yourselves. And I think, was you one of the very first lads out of that bunch of, to get a first team appearance? Out of that true class of 92, not so much Giggsy? Yeah, I wasn't the first. I think uh, out the, yeah, I mean, Giggsy was already well established in, in, in the first team squad yeah. with, with Sir Alex at the time, already made his debut, already scored. Uh, but yeah, I was. I, 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 yeah, we we all sort of followed uh, quite closely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I was uh, I was the start of uh, pretty much the start of of ninety four. It was February of nineteen ninety four, and uh, when I made my debut at West Ham and. And, um, so you're 18 years old making your debut. I mean, yeah. That's a big occasion for you. And it is. Do you remember that day especially? Massively. Yeah, I remember coming into the cliff and and. Um, and I, I was as I would normally do. I was ready to train with the with the reserves with Jim Ryan, mm. um, and kiddo um, kiddo came down the stairs, Brian Kidd, and he said to me, uh, he said he pointed at me through you know the glass partition at the bottom of the stairs, yeah. and he pointed at me, and uh, and I, I, I thought I, I knew I hadn't done anything wrong. I'd only just walked through the door, <laughs> and he said uh, he said you're you're coming with us tomorrow, and they were obviously going to West Ham. He said train with 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 Jim today as normal, okay. but he he said tomorrow come in train with us bring your suit and then we'll uh, and then take your car over to to Old Trafford and nice. the coach will leave from there and uh, and that was it it was just whirlwind you know there was no there wasn't any you know grand sort of gesture it was literally like you know kiddo coming down getting ready his numbers sorting his training out and he had just happened to see me and and he told me to make sure i, I bring me flannels as he called them and me and my club jacket and uh, and that i would be traveling with the squad to west ham uh, and back then there were only three subs yeah in 94 so i also knew that um unlike in you know times after that when I'd got myself in squads and there was a, only a, a very small chance I thought there was a, a and one of them was obviously a goalkeeper as well mm. so there was a goalkeeper Les Seeley and two subs um, which were me and Dion I think um, and Dion was the reason why I didn't see the City game on Wednesday night because I was on a train with him coming back coming back up to Manchester from London oh, right. in, inadvertently anyway so so you get to the stadium and did, did you start the game or was you, did you come on a sub? No, 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 I, I came on a sub. On a I sub. came on a sub for Dennis, yeah. Yeah, so um, when I got my debut, the kit, you remember the, the gaffer used to set out the kits? And yeah. you were like, oh my God, I the, the gaffer it. didn't do it. No, the kit man. <laughs> they got, they, they got, I can't have to say that, that's just that's the way it was. But yeah. for yourself then, you, you're on the bench and you, you're probably watching the game thinking maybe tonight might be the night. Not quite sure whether you was going to go on. And then suddenly the gaffer might say, right, go and warm up. What type of feeling was that? Yeah, it's a huge. I mean, I, I must admit, because like I said, there was only two subs. I, I, I didn't see the point in him bringing me down there if he wasn't gonna, if he wasn't gonna use me. Yeah. Um, that's not to say that I was one hundred percent, but I was pretty sure that there was a good chance, no matter what the score might have been, that at some stage I would have got some minutes. And sure enough, um, and I was so glad as well because he must have sent, Kiddo must have sent me out two or three times, and that's also. 
a fairly unpleasant place to be warming up. Uh, Upton Park is a really tight ground and the fans are very close to the pitch. And I think I've, I only had Les Seeley, God rest his soul, to, to thank for deflecting some of it away from me because he was giving some of the fans back some right abuse. Oh, nice, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I was so glad that when I was out warming up, I did get the, you know, the hand gesture to say, come back, you know, get your, get your tracksuit top off and you're going on. And when you went on, did you obviously enjoy the experience? Oh, did you brilliant. feel nervous or did you just relax into the game? How did the game go for yourself, would you say? Um, well, the game, personally, I mean, it was only on the pitch for, you know, the best part of 20 minutes, I think. It wasn't any longer than that. Uh, but we were 2-1 down at the time. Okay. Um, and fortunately, with about two minutes to go I think Ince equalised and, and made it 2-2 but I was really happy with my contribution and it was a great it was a great feeling to be to be on there with, with so many great players and uh, at such an early age and something that I'll I'll never forget was shaking hands with Dennis Irwin as I'm uh, as I'm coming on for him and making my debut yeah that's an amazing feeling of course in that kit it's this black kit here. I was wearing the black kit yeah nice yeah. very good so then I imagine, was you around the first team a bit more? Was you training with the first team then or did you go straight back to the reserves? I went back to the reserves. I played a few games with the reserves. I did train from time to time, but I, f as far as I can remember, I don't think I was in any more match day squads until um, I got um, um, a call from the manager to go and see him, uh, asking me how I was and how I was feeling and what have you, and, uh, and that there was a good chance that um, I would probably have to start the FA Cup semi-final against Oldham uh, at that following weekend but he wanted me to go and and not disrupt my plans and, and still play the reserve game on the Wednesday night against Blackburn. So this is the sliding doors moment uh, obviously uh, most people know who Ben is but ultimately th things happen in life and you don't know why but Ben was about to play in this game against Oldham in the semi-finals, it was a big game um, but you played against Blackburn and um, I don't know what it was, 65th, 70th minute, you got a horrific tackle on you, yeah. which ultimately probably changed your life forever. Yeah, it did, yeah. Yeah, there's no two ways about it. It was a, it was a bad tackle. Um, I mean, there's no there's no real necessity to to go into the ins and outs. I mean, like I said, it, 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 is, it is all documented in my book, what happened, because it was part of my life and a big part of my life. Um, and yeah, it did... It certainly um, scuppered any um, any further chance that I had uh, to to play regular first team for Man United, and I'm I'm pretty sure that without the injury uh, and the way things were going for me, that I certainly would have been given that opportunity by Sir Alex to to have uh, like all the others, um, you know, made made numerous appearances for the first team. Whether I would have done what Gary did, what what scores he did, what gigs, or what, nobody would have done what gigs he did. But whether I would have stayed at, at one team for the rest of my career, probably in the position that I played in, I very much doubt. Um, but I certainly am confident enough in in a in Sir Alex and, and B my own ability that I, I would have at least been given that opportunity and, and perhaps would have uh, would have made a decent fist of a career at, at, at Man United even even with Giggsy in the team you know the manager had already made overtures that, that if you're good enough then you'll play and and I uh, I certainly felt as though he was he was leaning towards that, but like you say, Cluggy, things uh, things are sent to test you. Things are sent, uh, and and they do change your life. And and that tackle did that to me because I was never the same player afterwards. Well, obviously, with that injury, which was really bad, um, you end up really. I mean, your knee destroyed. You know, I think you did your MCL, your PCL, your ACL. You ruptured your hamstring. Your meniscus was damaged. And back then, that was a real. Um, real difficult injury to sort of recover from. I know Rob Swire was the first person on the pitch who um, sort of uh, assess you, and um, you obviously come off. And, um, and, and did you ever sink in at that moment in time how bad the injury was, or did you not realise really? I knew that I knew that it was bad because I, you know, everybody who was in the vicinity, even in in the stand, and, and even Gary Walsh, who was the goalkeeper at the time, seventy yards away at the other end of the field, he he, he heard the, the 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 crack, and it wasn't a shin pad. Um, so you knew that it was a, it was a bad tackle, and and I certainly knew with the pain that I was in and. And the fact that I I I, I knew where the guy had hit me, mm. that it that there was significant damage had been sustained, and and you know my fears were confirmed when, 
when uh, when Jonathan Noble opened me up the following morning and and said that my knee just fell apart like putting the book uh, putting a, a, a book on its spine and watching the pages just fan out and that's exactly what he said my knee did and uh, and yeah I I, I had um, I was very very lucky that that at the time uh, I was at the best club and 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 David Fever the the physio that was taking over that summer who'd had um, who'd had a history of being able to deal with these and, and rehabilitate these sorts of injuries with with his time at, at Wigan Rugby League, where the the, the injury was more frequent. Um, that I had his his uh, you know his expert help plus obviously the the uh, the expertise of of Jonathan Noble who 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 was the surgeon that repaired it and and with a combination of the two I was. I was amazingly. I played my first game um, in the beginning of November of the same year. Okay, so you're probably out for about one year with that, and obviously physically and mentally, you, you, your body's been tested. You know, every day going into training, trying to get this rehabilitation done, making sure you're doing the work with day fever. But mentally, who? So how, how did you manage that period of time? You need to. Um, you need to sort of bounce it off many different people. I mean there were times when 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 Dave Fever could could tell that I wasn't mentally ready to do the work that he'd set for me. Mm. Um there were times when my mum and dad knew that I was I was down was so when some of my friends knew that I was down the manager who'd said, you know, he used to bring me in every now and again and say how you're feeling and I'd tell him either yes I'm I'm feeling great and things are going really well or do you know what I'm getting a bit fed up of being in that gym on my own I have to be honest with you and and I don't want that to to affect the, you know my, my, my physical work if 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 mentally I'm not up for it then physically I'm not going to do it um and he was really really understanding about that and there was many a time that he you know he'd say you know just wh whenever you feel like it just have a you know have a have a long weekend or have an extra yeah. couple of days or whatever it is he was really good like that because he knew that it was a lot to take on for anybody but as an 18 year old kid to have a, a career threatening injury when when you know when you things were looking quite rosy yeah. uh, it must have been a lot for me to take mentally rather than just physically and can you remember that time back now or is it, is oh, it yeah, so, can, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, can, I can remember it vividly that you know I, I, I was going into to the cliff and and the the lads were just starting the pre-season training in July and as even in Manchester the weather was great and uh, yeah. and I'm stuck in and you know what the gym was like at the at the cliff club it was uh, it was it was down a, a set of stairs the windows were high um, and it was quite a, it could be if you when you're on your own and you know that things are going on outside and because of what you've got to deal with it can be quite a soul destroying place but the, the having having people like like Dave around me um it was always cheery and and uh, but but still solid in in the work that he needed you to do um there are people along alongside my family like the manager like dave like my teammates that uh, that got me through when when times were, were particularly bad good and with all that hard work and that support you ultimately did, did get through it didn't you so one year later you actually get back on the pitch you're training and you, you manage to get a playing with the first team again yeah um, something that I never thought that I would ever do um, but one thing I did know was that it would never become a regular thing yeah. um, and that was why when in 1995 I got the the opportunity to go on loan to Stockport County I grabbed it with both hands um, and I did exactly the same thing when I came back from there and was offered the the rest of the season from January onwards to go and and uh, play under Brian Horton at Huddersfield Town uh, which is you know two years later where I ended up signing on a permanent basis and those um, and, and that year was a particularly good one for me not just because it was getting me back from my injury but it was building up my confidence as well and I was playing I was, I was coming from a time when I thought well you know am I ever actually going to play again mm. uh, which was the overtures that, that Jonathan Noble was making at the time because it was such a bad injury um, to playing league football and going from league what we know as League One up into now what we know as the, the championship in, in Huddersfield Town which was where they were and uh, and I 
thorough and I loved it and it got me my recognition for um, for the England under 21s at the end of that season that yeah. I played with, with with Bex and Terry Cook was in the team as yeah. well you remember uh, and, and numerous other players that you Lee Bowyer that you will remember from over the years from from playing football so yeah it was um, it was a good season for me that in in more ways than one and and uh, and uh, I, I, it was a particularly difficult period between there and and playing my first game for the the injury and, and playing my first game because you just didn't know how it was going to hold up so you've done remarkably well with the recovery getting yourself back playing football regularly get holding a first team spot down getting into the England under 21 team there and you must have thought right I've finally got myself going but in and amongst that when you signed full time for Huddersfield it must have been still difficult to Realise that you had to step away from Man United. Yeah, of course. You had to say your goodbyes, yeah. or you know, I, I was that. Yeah, for? nobody, nobody, um, nobody ever wants to leave a club like Man United. But I think the realisation has to come sooner rather than later if you are going to make a, a, a career out the game, Cleggy. Is that you, you? You need to be honest with yourself. Mm. And yes, it, it, it's fantastic having the having the you know the the prestige of of being associated with Manchester United. But realistically, if you're not playing. Um, and you get into the the age that I was at the time of of, of sort of 22, 23, um, and you were still only playing reserve team football when you'd made your league debut four years earlier. Yeah. Then you knew that you you had a decision to make if you were going to continue to make a career out of the game, and uh, and that was what I did. And, and truth be known, I probably would have signed for Huddersfield if anything could have been agreed at the end of that 95-96 season yeah. but I let my uh, my heart rule my head really and, and I didn't probably stand up to Sir Alex as much as I should have done um, because partly because I, I love Man United so much and he was convincing me to, to stay a, an extra two years which I duly did but at the end of those two years at the end of the 97-98 season um, I went back in we had exactly the same conversation and this time he was in full agreement that he would he would support me in, in anything I wanted to do anywhere I wanted to go um, and that I, um, I, would, I, I would go with his blessing yeah, we know he's a very fair guy, and, and in that sense, he, he, he probably wanted to look after your post injury. He gave you them two years. You probably didn't really get established that back in the first team, so he allowed you to. But we had some great times. We went on a, a few pre season tours, didn't we? We did, yeah. We went over to Australia and Japan and different places. So, with, even in difficult times, there were so many benefits of being at Man United, you know, learning that sort of discipline and being around them players was around. Yeah, they were, they were, um, they were a great bunch of great bunch of guys uh, and we've seen in, uh, certainly in in the time we were there Clay we've seen so many coming and going I was there for seven years and thoroughly enjoyed every single moment of it apart from obviously getting injured uh, but we did we we saw places we went places we were involved in in some brilliant games and uh, and yeah I, I, you know even in the short space of time that I had playing as a first team player for Man United I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't change it for the world and it's something that nobody can can take away from either of us. Exactly. So to, let's just reminisce on two points. Um, one is you obviously played with this guy. Yeah. And I played with him as well. But I think you played in the game where they played against Sunderland, where I was, where he just tell me about that goal yeah. and playing with that man. How good that must have yeah, been. I, 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 I think I came on as a sub and we were already cruising. I think the, the final score was 5 0. Yeah. But um, I remember going out on the left hand side and seeing Brian McClare picking the ball up. And I, I was free, I was, I, was, I was open to receive a pass. But he carried typical chockey. He, he carried on running with it um, straight down the middle of the park. And uh, and he and I think he passed it to Eric, uh, and he got it back. He gave it back to Chocky, who in turn gave it back to him. Um, and from a, a seemingly impossible, not an impossible angle, but the, the the gap that he must have had to be able to chip it over. I think it was Lionel Perez was the goalkeeper at the time, and he just dinked it from the edge of the area. And everybody could see where it was going, and there was even Perez could, and there was nothing he could do about it, and it just crept in in the in the the stanchion between crossbar and post, and he turned with his arms held out like that, with his chest puffed out as well, and he sort of rotated a little bit as if to say, and then the arms lifted up. 
and it was a brilliant celebration. It was if to it was if to say, you know, that's that's what I'm all about. Yeah. That's me. Uh, and I think that that was his was his last season, and I think he was probably just saying, you know, if you're going to remember me for anything, then just remember me for that goal because it was special, and it was special. Well, he's an, ic an iconic figure, an iconic goal, and for you to be there that day yeah, to is, see that, it's incredible. Yeah, they still show it now. It is, like you say, it is an iconic goal, yeah. and and if they do show uh, uh, any. Of, of Eric Cantona's goals playing for Man United then you can rest assured that that one is top of the list that's right I don't think too many players who've come along has been as good as this player so what an honour to play with Eric yeah, Cantona you know very influential ju not just on the field but off the field as well the way that he he prepared himself um, and the way that he, he conducted himself in terms of when we you know what it was like when we were at the cliff and they had the metal railings out for the fans to stand behind and Eric would happily go along and, and sign out. He wasn't on his own, uh, but Eric was certainly one of the ones that would sign everybody's autograph and, and off the field he, he, was, he was as influential and a great role model to follow as he was on. Yeah, absolute true legend. Going back to yourself, though, you ultimately signed for Huddersfield. Um, there's a United connection there, was there? Who was the manager? No. No United connection whatsoever. But there was, Brian, later, there was Brian later on. There was Steve Bruce there. Was Steve Bruce McCurry. came came afterwards. Yeah, the the um, the manager that signed me was Peter Jackson, okay. who played about 750 times for them in the league. I think between them and, and Halifax, uh, and he had Terry Yorath as his assistant, the, right. the ex Wales boss, Gabby's father. Yeah. Uh, he was a fabulous bloke, uh, and they worked really well together. Terry was the the, the real knowledgeable guy who'd obviously played the game at a very high level. And Peter Jackson was the, the the motivator. He was Mr. Enthusiasm, and and he loved the club, and you could see that. Um, and yeah, we 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 got off to a great start, and we I clicked with a lot of the players that were still there from my time from being on loan two years prior. Uh, and they bought in other players there, players like Marcus Stewart, who, who we all know from from playing for Ipswich in the Premier League, and and having a really and Sunderland as yeah, well of course yeah. and having a really a really good time of it and was also a cracking lad Steve Jenkins who was the full back who was a Welsh international uh, Barry Horn was there um, Dave Phillips who played for you know Norwich and, and Coventry so we had a um, we had a very good side we did have a very good side maybe two or three players short from from getting ourselves promoted uh, but we really felt as though we should have got ourselves into the playoffs and we had a, a really poor run in to the second half of the season. I would say the last 12 games uh, we were in pole position and at to uh, in, in I think it was like September, October time we were top of the league right. um, and we fell away dreadfully in the second half of the season and the same thing happened when Steve Bruce took over in the in the second year when um, we had a new owner who pumped quite a lot of money in and we bought players in on big money then people yeah. like Chris Lucchetti yeah. Kenny Irons Clyde Wynard came in from Leeds uh, George Donis came in from Blackburn and they were all on you know 250-300k a year which you know back then in the late 90s yeah. for a, a team outside of the Premier League was yeah. good going yeah. and of course you're relying on, on these players to, to deliver your success uh, and unfortunately um, it didn't work out for Steve Bruce. We we failed on the last game of the season. Louis Saha actually for Fulham destroyed us at Craven Cottage, and we never got into the playoffs. And the start of the following season, um, we just had a terrible time. George Donis never even came back to fulfil the second year of his contract, um, and we we just didn't start well as a team. And after ten or eleven games, we'd won one cup game. Um, and Steve Bruce got the bullet and Lou Macari who he'd brought in originally um, along, with Joe, uh, along with John Dean, um, he took over on his own and he brought in Joe Jordan to work alongside him and, uh, and again um, it didn't, things didn't go well uh, we didn't stop ourselves from falling through the trap door so with all those players on big money mm. um, Huddersfield fell another 
into another division and I think that that was what I, I left at the end of that season I went up to Scotland uh, to Aberdeen but I, I think if I'm right in saying that within I don't know if they had back to back relegations but certainly it wasn't long after that they fell into the bottom division and they were still stuck with these players that were earning that were earning big money on big contracts yeah that reminds me a bit like Sunderland more recently you can get into a spiral of too much money being sucked out of the club and if the players are not performing you can very easily drop two maybe one or two divisions yeah you know? and that's exactly oh, yeah Sunderland are a, are a case in point and, and certainly Huddersfield were from being you know really really close to, to challenging for a place in the Premier League yeah. Um, in the space of four or five seasons they find themselves str not struggling but they find themselves in, a, in a, an awkward financial position and uh, they're at the lower echelons of the football league so it, it was it, it, to, to see what they've done and where they are now okay it, it, things might run out for them this season but they've done fantastically well and I'll always have a have a soft spot for Huddersfield yeah, of course you will then obviously you went to Scotland I suppose slightly different league slightly different intensity how did you find it up there loved it loved the place um, it's very small Aberdeen but it's a it's a really great place to live um, I met my then um, wife who's, who, who's the mother of my child up there um, so that was obviously something positive that came mm. out of it um, and yeah we, we had a, again we had a very good side we qualified in our first year for the UEFA Cup nice. um, uh, but unfortunately we had a manager that um, as much as I liked him his ideas didn't really and, and hadn't sort of suited me the way that I'd been brought up to play football it was uh, it was a bit alien to me it was alien to anyone but <laughs> it was certainly alien to me he was a Danish guy who uh, who had some very very strange ideas um, and I decided that I was going to move back down to, to England and and uh, and I moved back down to Blackpool uh, under Steve McMahon right. um, but I did also find out that it was the manager at Aberdeen it was his final season um, and had I known that I probably would have stayed yeah because I know that the guys that took over uh, Steve Patterson and, and Duncan Shearer um, they wanted me to stay but I'd already committed myself and signed for Blackpool so that was that so you come back down to the, the North West again and I suppose you're a bit nearer to your family, so to speak, apart from your missus. So was she Scottish? No, she was from Aberdeen, yeah, but she um, she moved down and she, yeah, even though we're, you know, we're not together anymore, she she has, uh, she has met and married somebody else and has had a child and, and, and lives in lives in the North West still. Okay. So I, um, even though I'm not in the North West anymore, I, I still see my son on a, on a regular basis and, uh, and he was at Chelsea on Monday night, which he loved. Well, sure he did. So then I suppose you, you went to a fair few different clubs then from Blackpool, you went to Bury and to Halifax, um, you, you ended up playing for Bay Cup. I did, yeah. I ended up playing for Bay Cup, but I even played for Salford City as well for a while. Yeah. So, but that was before the, the <laughs> that was before the uh, the investment uh, kicked in. But yeah, I um, I played for Bay I played for Bay Cup under Brent Peters, who was brilliant. And one of our other joint friends come playing with you as well. There, did David May play? Maisie there? played with me there. Yeah, yeah. Maisie played there for a little while. He wasn't there a great deal, but he was there. He turned up when he wanted to. No, no, no. He, he, <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that. He turned up for every game, but he just wasn't there that long. Okay. Because uh, he had business interests that uh, that stopped him from being able to to commit. Um, Ian Hughes, who played a lot of times for Berry, he uh, he was there as well. So the, he, he, Brent Peters, who is Mr. Bake Up Borough, uh, had attracted some you know some decent decent people yeah, to, yeah. to his club. And the only problem was for, for poor old Brent was that the the pitch that he had up there was at the bottom of a of a of a hill, a steep hill, uh, and between anywhere between sort of November and February, you couldn't get a game on for love and the money, Good and you ended up playing thirty four fixtures in. <laughs> March on April, and it was uh, it was difficult, but a great guy nonetheless. Um, and one of the one of me, I think one of my fondest memories of, of of actually falling out of league football and playing non-league semi-pro, if you like, um, was was playing a, um, a, a, about three quarters of a season with my brother. Okay. At Whitton Al uh, Albion, yeah. yeah. Uh, we played together. So after Bay Cup, you went to Salford. I went to and Salford. Then went to Whitton. And then I went to and then I went to Whitton. Yeah. And you played with your kid, yeah. I played. I, I'd actually after I went to Salford, I, I'd finished, and my brother, he convinced me. He said, "Why don't you come and do some training sessions with with, with Whitton Albion?" Um, and I did. 
and uh, I actually was the, the manager said to me I want you to to come back and do a full pre-season with us anyway the manager uh, things went on and he left and, and went and joined Halifax um, but the assistant manager stayed and took the job and, and he was adamant that he wanted me there and uh, and quite a lot of the players disappeared and went. Uh, we had to rebuild a whole new team but me and my brother were two of them along with the captain um, who stayed behind and uh, and yeah that was... Uh, that was that was a fond memory for me that of of playing of of being able to play in a team that meant something with 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 your brother yeah oh brilliant that must be nice yeah uh, as uh, as uh, gary and phil you know yeah. uh, th there's been numerous brothers that have played together um the charlton brothers as well so yeah. do you know what i mean it, it's uh, it, whatever level you play at it must be it must be quite a nice feeling so that was semi pro back then was it that was semi-pro, yeah. So how, how did you find that transition from professional football to semi-pro football? And did you have to get a job, so to speak, or maybe through compensation because your injury was okay for a while? Or, so how did you find that transition to normal life? Because it's, it's a very hot topic at this moment in time about football players transitioning from playing to normal life. Because I think there's, there's some statistics out there saying 85% of football players either get divorced or become bankrupt. Yeah. How did you find this type of pressures yourself? Well, I, I, I did the former, but uh, I, the latter hasn't hit me yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I did get, but I mean, you know, my divorce wasn't down to, I, I can understand why, why footballers do get divorced and, and you know, you, you, you've, you're involved in this huge, like, bubble, if you like, of mm. a lifestyle where, and, and like, yeah, I, I didn't, earn anywhere near the money in the game that would have allowed me to you know to to sort of rest on my laurels and say well I'm okay mm. uh, plus I, I always wanted to do something um, but I can understand how easy it is to fall into that trap when you're earning millions and millions of pounds mm. um, and sometimes you forget you know that football is a very short career mm. and even during that time you still need to maintain a relationship you know even if it if if that's what you so desire and you want to do that i mean some footballers don't you know don't even bother with the you know the getting married thing uh, they're happy doing what they do on their own and they, they might wait until after they've actually finished before they so before they do it well. but you know we know from experience that most of them don't um they, they do get married during the time that they are playing football and it is a shame when things go a little bit awry because they've they they're not not using the a marriage of what a, a normal marriage would be and that is you know spending time together and yeah. making sure that they have quality time together because we know that being a footballer you're away a lot especially successfully you're not just away with your club you're away with your country as well uh, and it's important that the quality the short time that you do spend together is quality time to make sure that you know you still know each other and you you know if you have a family that you you you, you have days out and you have date nights and whatever else it is that it's important because I'm pretty sure that that is the reason that all of a sudden all the banter and, and what you camaraderie that you're used to on a daily basis is gone and then all of a sudden it, it's just you and your missus and she's been used to you know going to you know meeting up with the other wives and what have you and, and going to nice places and, and all of a sudden that's gone it's stopped um, and that must be a, and that's a big thing that because that's hard to deal with anyway, especially if you, you haven't got anybody to bounce it off and they're just as fed up about it as you are. And that is where I'm sure the, the, the relationship breaks down. And it's important that even though you, you are a professional football and you are earning a lot of money, you know, that your football is not going to go on forever, but hopefully your marriage will if you work at it. It's like anything, if you work at it, the chances are it will be a success. And uh, and if you don't, then it, it, it falls by the wayside and that's why people get divorced. Yeah, and I even think that the players who are playing in the lower leagues, they, they find that transition maybe having a reasonable salary for a while, but, you know, we know that players are dropping out of the levels of football all the time. It's not just when you're 35. There's players who, who, who don't get past being 18 no, or past 21. Not. There's players every year, you look at the, the transfer list there, and there's lads at 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. They thought they were going to have long-term careers, and suddenly it's stopped for some particular reason. They can't get another contract. So then they have to transition into actually getting a, a normal job, and you don't get that same buzz. You don't get that same feeling. You know. So, so what did you do post-football regarding transitioning to your next job, so to speak? 
Because obviously now you do punditry and stuff. I do, yeah, but I mean that that was that was only you know a little bit. That was just sporadic. That yeah. um, every every so often, MUTV would, would when when they were first setting up um, would would give me a call. You know, maybe once a month or once every six weeks to say uh, can you do you know can you come down and do the commentary for the game which was great mm. I mean obviously now it, it happens on a much more of a regular basis but what what I'd earned up to that stage and what I'd invested to go away uh, for, for my later life um, what I had was was not gonna it, it was just it was going to dwindle, mm. so um, I was sort of thrashing round really, and and believe it or not, Cleggy, I t I took uh, just to, as an interim thing, uh, I took to, to driving a, a taxi for a for a, really? for about eighteen months, yeah, yeah, just because I knew that it was something that I could do, that it was something that I could that I was that was flexible, and obviously something that if I put the hours in, I would still be able to to earn a you know to earn a few quid, but it's better than you know doing nothing. Because you've got to survive, aren't you? Of course. So was that in the northwest or because you moved? No, that was in that was still up here. That yeah, that was still up here. This was um, this was probably going back to. 2006 2007 so I was doing that while I was still playing at Witten so you know I was I was okay do you know what I mean I was okay it wasn't what I, I wanted to do no, of course not. but um but sometimes like you said needs must mm. and you have to do things like that you know I, I, I documented in my book like I said that you know I did that I um I I, I ran a, a, a Chinese restaurant for a, <laughs> yeah. a yeah I ran a Chinese restaurant what, for, for what's six you, months what, what's your best dish I don't cook them. I didn't cook them. <laughs> I didn't cook them. Um, but it was a, it was a great restaurant and I loved it. But again, uh, you know, I, I had to be that. Not my passion. And uh, and it's, but it, I I I sort of it was falling into the the meeting people thing mm. um, because I was the manager and uh, you know I was hosting people coming through the door and sort out any problems because all you know a lot of the staff were were were, were foreign. Yeah. And uh, and and. It, it was it was easy for me to be able to do that, um, but again, it was it, they were antisocial hours, and it was stopping me from doing other things. And by this time, um, you know, my my relationship had had, set, had started up with a girl that was living a long way away, and the only time I could get to see her was weekends. And if I was at the restaurant the weekends, blah blah blah. So it was something that I had to again, I had to. I had to pass by, and then my brother-in-law, who um, who started up this this his own company, um, fell in with with River Island, and uh, and I went working with him on on River Island shops for what's up? Check whose weather's in River so, Island. No, 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 it's not. No, no, it's not. Um, and so I did that with him on and off, uh, not every week, uh, for the best part of three or four years. But then. Um, I started to get invited onto onto trips away. I started to get m uh, more—I wouldn't say frequent, but more work more often with with MUTV. And then back in 2013, I got asked uh, to go back and and do um, and and do the hospitality suites at Man United for every home game, which uh, which apart from being you know financially rewarding was something that with the restaurant I'd been quite used to and uh, and something that I've been doing there now for every home game for well to, to, to date um, my first game was when Nanny was sent off in in the Champions League was it really, into yeah? Alex's last season yeah so uh, March 2013 we're now nearly so I've been doing that now for this is my sixth season and I love it but when I look at you Ben and knowing you from the past and now you talking about football the stories this is almost like a second um, career which is a dream job really yeah it is for me it is because I love <laughs> I do love talking but um, <laughs> but the one thing that I do love talking about is is football I yeah. have a passion for it I've you know I've seen it I've, I've, I've played it which I think is is one of the or is one of the key elements to have uh, be able to, to talk, talk about, about anything about is, is the fact that you've been there and done it uh, but also I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I, I've I've been sort of close to to people and, and or footballers who are friends that have played at the highest level which meant that you know quite a lot of the time I've been watching very it high level football and I, and I listen to people um, and I pick things up from you know for my own um, for my own way of doing things as well 
Um, and I, I, I love talking about it and, and whether it's doing it for, for TalkSport, for MUTV, for the BBC, it doesn't matter to me that um, as long as I'm, I'm watching a game and I'm being able to commentate on it, um, I prefer it to be Man United, but that's not always the case. Um, but certainly these last sort of two, three months of, of being a Man United fan as well as working for the club has been, has been like you said, Cleggie, an absolute dream, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a great time to be a part of uh, Man United again with, with Ollie being involved and all this new stuff coming. So, but Ben, you got your book out again, guys, buy his book, it'll be a, an awesome read, I'm sure. Um, just to finish off, Ben, first of all, thank you very much, it's been absolutely awesome. But five five, five no questions I always ask just to finish. Okay. Um, so first of all, who is your biggest influence on your career? Um, I think I'd probably have to put it down to two. I mean, everybody's going to say my dad, and he, he has to be because he supported me all the way through it. But Sir Alex Ferguson and, and Eric Harrison, who, who obviously has, has just passed away recently, I think if I, if I didn't mention the two of those in the same breath, then uh, I wouldn't be doing... I'd be doing one of them a, a disservice. So, along with my father um, and my family, obviously, um, Sir Alex and, and Eric Harrison. Very good. And all the different things you've had, all the successes and the, the, the issues. What's your one um, one favourite moment of your of your life or your career? My favourite moment. There were two. Um, the first one was was winning the Youth Cup because that was was the the real benchmark for for what hopefully we would have been able to go on and achieve. And obviously, I couldn't have envisaged what was going to happen to me. But certainly, the rest of the lads, you know, deserved everything that they got out of the game. There's no question. But that was the first real test. Of uh, of uh, and and the first real yardstick of uh, as as to how good a player and how good a team we were, um, and making my debut. I think that anybody that can turn round, no matter how many times you play, no matter uh, you can only ever do it once. But anybody that can turn round and say I made my debut for Man United's first team, that's got to be a, a, a special sentence in anybody's vocabulary. It certainly is. Um, not, maybe an obvious one with yourself. But what's your, your biggest regret? My biggest regret, apart from obviously sustaining the injury, I think my biggest regret is never having scored a goal for Man United's first team. Yeah. I think the number of times that I came close, and and I still get reminded of some of the horrendous misses that I uh, that I had in a in a Man United shirt playing for the first team. I scored them at junior level. I scored them in reserve team level. I never managed to get the chance. And I think apart from the injury, that is that is one thing that I've ne I've never got one goal that I scored for Man United to watch ever. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, on a more serious note, what's your advice to any young players watching um, who may be going through their own issues or the up and coming very good players? What one or two bits of advice would you give them? Um, I'd certainly say always listen, um, always be respectful, and and I think the most important one is, especially in this day and age, um, of in the issues we've just been talking about, players, you know, falling out of the game at an early age. Don't be afraid to speak to people. Yeah. The, there's so many issues now going on with, excuse me, with, with uh, concerning mental health and, and people and, and companies that want to help, um, not just players who, who finish and not just footballers, but but anybody in the sport where where mental well-being can be uh, can be improved. Don't ever be afraid of, of speaking to somebody and confiding in someone. You will always find someone that will listen and that will help and that will want to help. That's certainly good advice and certainly something I'm advocating all the time. And lastly, um, what are your hopes and dreams for the future? Um, to stay healthy. Um, that is that is something that I'm 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 advocating all the time um, to stay healthy um, and just to to be happy. You know, I, I love doing what I'm doing at the moment I'd and I would love it to continue. Uh, I'm not on any sort of a contract, so you never know what, uh, at whatever time the, 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 the thing that you're doing can come to an end. Uh, but as it is at the moment, I'm, I'm as busy now as I've, as I've ever been with, with football, especially with Manchester United and, and watching them up and down the country and, and, uh, and, and doing my me, me media work with them. So, yeah, I, I, as long as I'm healthy, as long as I'm happy, I'm I'm pretty sure that I, I'll always find something but right now this is what I'm doing and, and I'm hoping I can do it for a long time to come. Well Ben I think that's a great way to finish I want to thank you for coming you've been a fantastic guest so I wish you all the very best. Cheers mate thank, well, you. Well, yeah, well, cheers. thank you.